right. So some of you guys have had some questions on public law 94-241. Uh, in that public law proceeding, it's talking about the United States of America taking over or bringing into their trust territory. They've created a covenant for the Northern Mariana Islands. And uh, this is exactly how they've allowed all of the amendments to be applied to those territories. So now those people are now considered citizens who were born March 24th, 1976 and after. So the question is, is how does that apply to us? I mean, although we have parents that are older than 1976, some of us are born before 1976. Or even after that, how does it apply to us? Why do we have to use Section 302 to get us out of it? And the thing to note here is that it's talking about a trust territory. It's talking about a covenant. So what they're applying to the Northern Mariana Islands is the very same thing that they've applied to all of the other countries within the North American continent. So yes, I'm a California national, I was born there. You may be a New Yorker national, you may be a Michiganianite, however they say it, but those are completely foreign to the United States. When you look at section 301 of that public law 94-241, it's talking about citizens or nationals of the United States. And we know the United States is a term, a DBA term for the District of Columbia. It must be specific. It must say, are you a citizen of the United States of America or are you a citizen of the United States? You will never find them say or ask you if you are a citizen of the United States of America. Impossible. It can't happen. You can only be a national of Delaware within the territory of United States of America. So that's how that works. And, and so in section 302, you'll find that people who are born in 1976 within the Northern Mariana Islands, if they're gonna be considered to be US citizens or nationals in the United States, if they don't make that specific declaration. So that declaration applies to them, but it also applies to everyone else who are still subjected to the covenant or that trust territory that they put together. So it applies to you, you do this very same thing. So that's why we add it to our acts or conditions when we do our passports. Um, on that note, some of you have your passports and all of that, you, you, you have no issue of getting a birth certificate to show uh, proof of identity or U.S. citizenship to correct your status. But some of you have are having issues to even get the birth certificate. Um, I'm going to have a little procedure for you. And the answer lies right within the instructions of the actual passport if you can't get your birth certificate. So I won't share that here today because that takes a, a lot of time. But just know that there is a remedy for you. If you can't get your birth certificate. Uh, there is an alternative. One little cue that I can give you is um, what they call that a birth announcement. Birth announcements are something that you definitely want to use retroactively for yourself. I don't care if you have a birth certificate. You want to use a birth announcement um, for many reasons. I, I don't want to get too far into it, but if you guys have seen the junior course material version 2.0, where we are talking about the Vatican and the calendar dates and all of that stuff. Uh, please check that out because that will be a precursor to that information that I drop on that and how birth announcement will be a remedy to move away from the birth certificate power that they have. All right. So I see a few hands raised. I'm going to go to Christina. Christina Ellis, you are unmuted. Just unmute your mic on your end. How are you? Christina Ellis, are you there? 
Is your mic on? No? Okay, let's go to Vicki O'Brien. Unmute your mic, please. Hi, good morning. Hey there. I just have two quick questions for you. Um, the first one is, when we go to submit um, the UCC1 within our states, do we need to submit a copy of the promissory note with it or just notate it on the UCC1? Because I live in Texas and I submitted a copy of my promissory note with it and they kicked it back to me saying that it was fraudulent. Right, right. Some states will allow you to do it. So just do it um, in the county level first as a non-UCC mm -hmm. and then reference that on the UCC1 with the state as a one sheet document. You don't need to attach the promissory note again. Okay, I will do that. I will try that again since mm -hmm. they're acting crazy. The second, thank you. The second question is this. Um, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, forgive me if I cry. Um, my husband suddenly passed away a few weeks ago. Um, mm -hmm. Ken, and we have his trust set up and everything, and we have it registered and everything, but would I be able to do the IRS injunction and file for his taxes paid on his behalf for him if I'm a trustee on his trust? My condolences to you and family. Thank you. It, um, it's very tough to deal with. A lot of times, for reasons as this, I would appoint a fiduciary to do it. But since you are already the trustee, you have choices. In a trust, as a trustee, you take on the role of the executor, so to speak, for the estate. And you also have the power to assign that right over to someone else to do it who's knowledgeable. Yeah. So, yes, you can do that. You, you can, as a trustee, just make sure that uh, for his trust, um, at the bottom of the trust forms, it talks about um, the proper term, I'm going to use this term, but it's not exactly what it is on the form, but just like a personal representative, um, you will sign that, but also give the power of attorney form in addition to that. So whatever documents are sent in for that trust, it will be accompanied by that power of attorney form. You don't need form 56 for fiduciary, just a simple okay. power of attorney as a trustee. And that will allow you to have any funds that are coming back to be directed to um, an additional trust. So, which means you can update his um, his existing trust to show that maybe the beneficiary to that would be a trust enterprise. So, it allow you to open up a bank account and mm -hmm. to allow any funds to go directly into that, so that you and the family can have access to it. Okay, if I already had a um, trust enterprise set up for him, can I have it directed to that? You can. Are you the trustee to that one as well? I am. I am. That's perfect. Okay. All righty. Thank, no Thank you very much. Right. Very well. Very well. We'll be praying for you and the family to get through this difficult time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. We are here beyond just simple uh, basic consultations for our internal affairs, for the emotional affairs that we are here to give an ear to and give advice because we've been through it. We know. Let's try again. Uh, Christina, if you're, I'm going to unmute you, but um, if you can't, then go ahead and put your question in the chat room. I'll see if one of my reps here can help me monitor that. Because your mic is having difficulties. Okay. So you can continue to work on it, but if you can't fix it, go ahead and put your question in the chat and we'll get to it there. Um, we have Miss Spam 910. You are unmuted. Hey, Avery. How you doing? Hey, I'm good. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm struggling trying to get my birth certificate authenticated. It got sent back to me. Okay. Um, and it's saying it was incorrect for the country of use. Mm -hmm. which I, I think I picked Sierra Leone and, and it evidently wasn't a non-Hague. 
And so it came back though with the um the, the sticker on it from the state of North Carolina apostille. Mm-hmm. Um on the from the Secretary of State. So do I just need to do it over with the DS um forty one ninety four. Yeah, just do it over and pick because I thought I picked one that was um in use the country, but mm-hmm. evidently I didn't. Um so just uh-huh. do it over and send it back to the what state are you in? In North Carolina. Okay. Um when do you know for sure if the North Carolina Secretary of State, when he gave you the apostille or the authentication? Does it have on there the country that you wanted it for? It doesn't. Good. So you can just take it as is and send it to the Department of State using 4194. And this time use Taiwan. Taiwan? Okay. And okay. Should... And, does it, and does it matter what? Because um, I get confused with the long form and the short. Does it matter which one? The one I sent didn't have the doctor's name on it. Um, no, it's fine. If the Secretary of State wouldn't have done it if it was the wrong form. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. And then just send it back to the federal level and then do the other Minnesota and the ownership. Mm-hmm. Okay. You got and, it. And then another question, the um W four for work. Mm-hmm. I had looked at your video about signing it without the US. Does your status have to be changed in order to sign it that way? No, it doesn't. Naturally, your status is already what it is. Are you born in North Carolina? Oh, yeah. So naturally, you are a North Carolinian. Uh-huh. Nat- it's it's this corporate fictitious person that they're attributing everything to as far as a tax. Now, every employer, they don't have to accept just the W-4. Some of them accept, they even have their own forms that's very similar to it, and they'll let you use that, and you can put exempt, and I'm not paying any I don't want anything withheld and they'll do it, but it just depends on the employer. So yeah. when you sign your standard W-4 and you put exempt in line 4C, yes, when you sign last comma first and then W forward slash out the U.S. Yeah, that's how I signed it, but I hadn't turned it in yet. Because I had expressed to them that I wanted to um, mm-hmm. stop having the taxes taken out. Because I did have the W-4 T. Mm-hmm. And um, I didn't never fill that out. So this is basically the same thing, though, right? W-4 T. Well, I say the right same now. thing, but the same outcome. Kind of. Kind of. W-4 T is like a. It's a private law contract between you and the employer because the IRS doesn't provide that form anymore. They used to. Yeah, because I could, I had a hard time finding it. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. y'all seen it from, got it from you or whatever. And so mm-hmm. far as like the taxes, I owe like $5,000 or whatever. Okay. So to pay those, because I set up a payment plan, I actually missed my payment. It's supposed to come out like a few days after Christmas or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, so to to discharge that or whatever, or resolve it, do I just send a ten forty B um with it? Testing, testing. One second, one second. There I don't go. know what that was. <laughs> All right, Christina, your mic is working, so I'm gonna mute you and then I'll come to you. Thank you. All right. So just so do I oh. like put stamps on it or do I No, I'm... no. What you what you do is since you already have an amount that's already been determined that you owe and you're making payments, just move forward with the standard accord and satisfaction procedure. Or and this is a procedure that I'm going to be showing 
um, that's coming into the uh, a newer website mm -hmm. for the taxes. Um, you can redo the very same taxes that you submitted um, as long as it was within the three years. Was it beyond three years or within? No, it was within. Okay. If it was within, you can do this. 1040X to correct it. Um, I would most likely connect this over to the, they call it the, uh, the gift tax exclusion limits. You get about 70, 17,000 per person for a lifetime of up to like 12.92 million. And mm -hmm. it requires, you know, you taking your entire income and you see how much you made, you see how much they've taken out, you see how much the net that you kept, um, you can actually gift the entire net over to beneficiaries within a trust, irrevocable trust. Each beneficiary would be one seventeen thousand increment. Mm -hmm. so for example, if I made a hundred and twenty three thousand, they took out thirteen. I got about ninety four thousand left. That's all mine, according to the IRS. However, I'm going to delegate or allocate 17,000 divided by 94, which is probably six people or six beneficiaries that I'm going to gift it over to. Mm -hmm. And I can do all that, all that, all the way up. Um, now, they say it's about 12 million for a lifetime, but what they do is they continue to reset that clock. And I think they do it every three to five years. Mm -hmm. So you never reach your lifetime limit unless you're extremely, extremely wealthy and doing extremely high amounts of money. Then there's a different method for that. But I will say just for you, just go straight into or court of satisfaction. Find some case laws where taxpayers have entered into a bona fide dispute with the IRS. And then they've given them, let's say your payment is $90 a month. They've given them a $90 a month check with specific words on it. Mm -hmm. IRS cashes it and you go ahead and send an enforcement letter uh, with the 1099C to cancel that debt. It'll be done. Okay. Is it a, a, a thing on this, the steps to go by? For accord satisfaction? Of course. Yes. Because I'm still stuck on the on the freshman. I think I've been in with you for about almost a year and I've been working a lot. And I had actually was signed up for two classes and then I finally had reached out to somebody on there. And she said, well, just delete that one if you're not. Because I was thinking I had to do one and move to the next one. And I was like stressed out about yeah. it. But, but I finally um, made um take that other account off. So. Yeah, yeah. Just, just go down on your left side of the bar. Mm -hmm. And you'll see you know, under specialty courses, you'll find according satisfaction there. Okay, I appreciate it because I got to get it taken care of. Yes, please get that bona fide dispute letter sent immediately. Like, hang up and do it now. I know that's right. I appreciate it. All right, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Talk to you next time. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Okay, Christina, unmuted. Alrighty, can you hear me now? Loud and clear, yes. Okay, um, well, is in regards to the birth certificate, I submitted, went to the vitals records of Virginia, and I requested two of my long versions with the actual signatures. The matter is, is that my mother had initially put my sister's father's last name on my birth certificate. And then when it became a discussion at the very, very early ages, she asked what did I choose to want to have? Anyhow, I took my mother's last name and it shows that it's been amended with her last name on there. But I don't know, and it does have the doctors and the registration, the, the actual signatures on there. So do I move 
forward with the authentication or do I need to still find the original with the before the amend, amendment? And also you mentioned about the um, footprints. And I do recall at the very early ages, I was born 75. Um, it's, we were, don't ask me how I remember this, but it's like, oh yeah, these are the footprints, you know, and I'm like, where is that birth certificate? Because I remember acknowledging and my mother had suggested maybe going to my preschool and since, or maybe even the hospital, but the hospitals changed to Virginia instead of Arlington now in, in Virginia, the name. So I don't know, am I okay with, with the amended, the, what I received already? And Is move forward the name with the, on your license the same last name of uh, your, your mother's last name? Yes. Okay, so it's just the birth certificate, which basically has your stepfather's last name. Um, he's not even my stepfather. My sister's my half sister older. My mother just wanted to try to make all of our names the same, and then um, when my father's father got involved, it became a dispute. So she's like, "Yeah, okay," and we're like, "Yeah, we don't want his last name. He's not even our father." Right. And but. It was best just to take hers because she has yeah. some tendency. Okay. Have you ever considered just doing the name change to correct it? I wasn't, as far as the correcting it to my my father's name. last name, because no, it corrected correct it to the name that's on the license, proof of identity. Oh, the license. She's yeah. She did that at my very, before I was even able to get a license. She did that when I was still in like preschool, not even barely in the, not even first grade. I recall when, mm -hmm. when she made the amendment, it was at is the very, very early ages. That's why I don't right. believe I'm like still boggled how that's stuck in my head. The day that gotcha. that all went down. Okay. Do you have a current passport? It's expired, so I figured that I'd go through this whole new process okay. and request a new one. But everything has, before I was even able to be going into preschool and all that, is being when she had already done the amendment to her last name, the Wanzer. And mm -hmm. so everything, all my life, Marine Corps, everything going it's, it's always wands or still it's listed as wands or I just grabbed Ellis since that's my my father's father's my actual the my name that I'm really um supposed to have but I did that just through social media I've never done any official gotcha. so I figured maybe maybe addressing that with this whole there's process no, there's no issue here there's no issue so if you're able to get if you were able to get a passport at some point in the past with the current information then the birth certificate that you have at hand you may authenticate it no problem because okay. there, and there, then that was would... the name change decree and order that was issued years ago to to back up your claims so you're perfectly fine okay. also say that okay. because and the procedures that I'm going to be showing you when you see the name change uh, process and also, like I mentioned, the birth announcement processes, uh, none of that's going to even matter. None of it. Okay. Okay. So um, it's just going to be considered trust property within your trust. Okay. All right. So th the Minnesota 220 continue to worry about that or just stand by and continue to still focus authenticate on? yeah still authenticate and then attach the affidavit of ownership which is the minnesota rule 220 information and attach it to it once you're fully authenticated okay all righty thank you good questions you're welcome all right we got your microphone fixed Let's go to John Green. Hello, Avery. 
Hi, John. Uh, really interested in the UCC3 process. So I went out to look for a secure, uh, surety bond and uh, kind of wandered around in there a little bit. Uh, you said that the surety bond is to protect our foreign trustee. Uh, my questions are protect from what or who? And there are lots of different types. I didn't know which one. I was kind of shopping prices. And the price came in at about $500 a year. So uh, what are we protecting from? Which type should I use? And the last one is, uh, is it just the first year or is it perpetuity? Uh, it depends on how long you want to do it. The company that I, or the website that I referenced, they allow you to go on online for 10 years. And that's about $250,000, which cost you 200 bucks. Um, but if you wanted to go longer than that, you could, like, let's say the term of the trust itself, 25 years, and then you do a renewal process, but that would have to be, um, you would have to submit documentation over to the underwriters for them to approve it. Now, to answer your question, who are you protecting from? It's insurance for the assets within the trust. So it's protecting the trust, which is the, the obligor. Um, it's protecting it from your trustee from ever going rogue. Now, I like to show that information uh, when I am having an, an attempt or a difficult time to record a UCC3 on the record. That way I can attach the bond to it and they see, okay, this is pertaining to a private law contract. We can't interfere. We must record it. Other than that, I know my foreign trustee is not going to go rogue in any way. Okay. Kind of. Uh, again, the 250K, uh, it came in at $500 a year. Uh, it was, I'm looking at the sheet they gave me. I, I selected a business service bond. Maybe that's the wrong kind. And three years was $1,500. Does that sound like I'm off off the rails here? Um, uh, yeah, it, no, that's that's about right. It's two hundred dollars for one year, and then it goes up from there. Oh, this is showing five hundred dollars for the first year. Uh, they may have changed their prices. Okay, okay, but I want a business service bond. Does that sound like what I want? Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'd yeah, like if you try to get a trustee bond, that's going to require a court case number. We don't have that. So. Okay, no need to go there? Yeah, no need to go there unless you're like in probate or something. Okay, no. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, Isaiah Fields, you are unmuted. Just got to unmute your mic. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. Good afternoon. So I have a question. I've been, I was looking to change my name and also engage into this process. I was wondering, is it, would be more beneficial to change my name first before I start the process or go ahead and it doesn't matter at what time do I change my name? Um, it, you want to start the process first and mm -hmm. the point where you get to that section where it's time to change your name and that's only for when you're ready to do the passport information. Okay. okay. All right. So if you don't have any need or rush to, you know, leave the country for whatever, um, then you can just hold off on that. Um, oh. you know, if you have somewhere to go, then get your passport as easy as you can. And so you can make that run and come back and then take care of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. All right. to Vento. You are unmuted. Mm -hmm. 
Greetings, Avery. Avery, how are you? Good, sir. Thank you. Good, good. Um, much light to the TZP family and Vicky, my deepest condolences. Um, Avery, my question pertains to a communication I was recently sent. Um, it was titled in interrogatories. I believe it was from an attorney. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I was wondering if uh, would a, a unique version of the counter slash cross, cross claim letter be a suffice response to an inter interrogatories um, communications I received? Um, yes, it would. Yes, it would. Interrogatories is basically just uh, them stating their claim. And, and they may have multiple claim points and they're looking for you to respond to them and provide your evidence to support yourself. If you ignore it, it's going to put you in latches and that'll give them an automatic declaratory judgment. So you can respond with a cross claim if you have something that you're requiring from them as far as like, a, uh, you know, they've done some offense to you. It is an irreparable injury. So you're countering what they've asked for you for what you're asking from them. But yours needs to be much higher, much stronger than their offense. That's what a cross claim is going to do. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, would it be also be suffice to maybe uh, structure into the document it itself uh, I, my nationality decree and also a rescission of signature somewhere uh, structured inside of there or would that not be needed well let me first ask who's who is the uh, plaintiff um so the initial person was uh cornerstone uh credit union and now there it's an attorney who is uh who actually sent me the uh, communications i believe okay He's representing the bank. He's yes, I believe that's the way it's structured. Okay. Credit card, personal loan. Uh, credit card, sorry. Okay. Um, request for in your claim under a title 15, 16, 35. Search there, but I want you to hit the word next. Let me show you an example of what I mean because each section in this particular part is uh, very different and unique. You can see my screen, correct? Yes, sir. 15 UC 1635 is a good place to start. Write a rescission. Now, this button here next. Okay. Next. I want you to keep going. Here we go. Open in consumer credit plans. This is for credit cards. Within here, you are going to find sections where they were supposed to give you the right to rescind. If you don't have any forms or disclosure, then that would be your main motive for a cross claim. So you're basically going to ask for it. Before I can give you what you're asking me for, Mr. Bank, Mr. Attorney, uh, we first need to resolve something from the inception of our agreement together. Did you give me proper disclosure under Truth and Lending Act? Did you give it to me? Here we are, we're talking about the disclosures. So they have to give you the right to rescind within three days from the consummation of the transaction. If they don't provide it, this entire thing is dismissed. Then that's when you move forward with penalties of damages punitive, monetary, what it may be, whatever it may be. Okay. You may have to consult with another attorney in defense just to pick his brain. They may, mm -hmm. they may understand the consumer finance laws and kind of tell you where, where they would direct you. You don't have to hire them. Just pay for a consultation, pick their brain. And they'll help you out with that. Part. Sure. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll have to take a look. Um, at the the document they have actually sent me um because it does 
it does have uh, copies of attached to it, like um, some statements that uh, I've like paid a balance towards. Like there's a monthly, couple monthly statements they added in there. Um, and there's, they actually, they have also included uh, parts where I may have signed like the document for, for the extension of credit for the credit card. Uh, you know what I mean? So in, <laughs> there's some other stuff that was signed at the bank uh, by me uh, that they've attached to this into interrogatories as well. So I will check to see if that uh, rescission was offered within what they have submitted to me. And if not, I'll definitely, well, either way, I'm going to check into the, uh, the 1635 for sure. Yeah, that'll be a good plan. Real good plan. Sure. Yeah, everybody, you can use that for almost any loan thing that you've engaged in with the National Association. Uh, start there as a main motive for entering into an accord and satisfaction or dismissing the entire case against you. So, yeah. Okay. And you've caught it right in time. It's a good thing that you're responding early and not waiting close to the 30, end of 30 days. So really good, really good. Um, well, that was all I had, uh, Avery. And again, best wishes to everybody this year uh, when it actually gets the beginning and in, in the springtime. And that's all I got. I yield the floor. Right. Thank you for coming in today. Thank Appreciate you for having that. us. Going to House of Henry Master. I like that. How's it going? Hey, greetings, greetings, Avery. How are you doing? Greetings to everyone in the zone. Greetings to you. Thank you. My question was: I received a name correction uh, that differs from the name correction that you 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 did you do uh, maybe a year ago. And what I did was we was. Well, not a name change, just a name correction from the uppercase, all caps name to upper lowercase, which is first initial upper and the rest of the initials lowercase. Uh, and I took the middle name uh, and put it with the first name. So the middle name is no longer there. The middle name is connected to the first name. Um, so I use my own petition that contained all uh, my substance, private American substance, uh, items, so names, so, so names um, and I made a declaration um, in that, that I'm not a U.S. citizen, but a national. Uh, it was granted by the judge and I received a exemplified triple seal copy. A national of what? Um, a state national. A state national. Yes. What state did you... How did you write it exactly? Um, I, I I sort of wrote it like what, as far as what you explained in your to, uh, to receive the passport. I basically did that same thing over a year ago. So it's very clear to the judge to approve that you said what you're not and what you are all in one sentence, right? Yes, I'm not a U.S. citizen. I make a declaration. I declare that I'm not a U.S. citizen. But a, a national. Did you say Nevada national, Oregonian national, or just national? Yeah, let me read. It. Let me read it. These are very, very important things that we can overlook. Everybody, right? Yeah. Um. So. Okay, yeah. 
Oh uh, yeah, I can. That's that's what I can do. Hold on, I got I have it right here. Let me pull it up. Uh, let me go to my files. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> man want to get on the mic okay so i uh where is it baby okay and if you guys have questions everybody else keep, please put them in the chat i'm thoroughly going through them Frenchie and i are going through them while we wait okay Uh, let's see, sent. Good question. For your national status, if you, what should you put if you were born in Washington, D.C.? So on your birth certificate, it's going to tell you the city that you were born in. Um, you're going to have to look at where the hospital was exactly. Washington, oh. D.C. is comprised of Virginia and Maryland, right? Okay. The combination of the two. So you are going to have to find out exactly where the birthplace was. Was it in the state line of Virginia or was it in the state line of Maryland? And that will determine if you are a Marylander or a Virginian. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So so in mine, I put, I declare my intention to be a national, uh, uh, but not a U, uh, uh, not a U.S. citizen or a citizen of the United States. Uh, now in there, I put um, my petition started out that let me let me get the first page for you. Um, the petitioner honorably and respectfully makes hope that the statements of this petition is true to the best of my knowledge, information, and the belief in states the following. Uh, I was born uh, privately private on the land commonly known as Texas, uh, or where I was born in Haiti, I'm sorry, but I, I would ingress this land by way of uh, West Palm Beach, Florida, headed west. And I mean, and when in uh, officially ingressed the private and land commonly known as Texas, and I intend to live in Texas, uh, the United States of America Republic indefinitely. Uh, petitioner states that I have never been convicted of a state or federal felony, and is not requesting a name change to defraud creditors for any fraudulent reasons. Um, and I gave the the upper my my lowercase name and the current legal name I, I put it in all upper cases without prejudice in in an abundance of caution. The legal title the petitioner is seeking is the lowercase name upper lowercase name to be distinguished and exonerated from the uppercase name as a form of civil exoneration under the doctrine of surety ship with me being implied surety. Uh, so I, the petitioner states that the uppercase name is not her property because the state name is at the top, not her, not, uh, not her. I mean, not, I'm sorry, not him and his parents signatures are not on the certificates. Only a government official is on a certificate. There's no evidence that, um, uh, my parents named me the uppercase name. Uh, which I have the, the name spelled out. A uh, petitioner wishes to assume the legal, new legal name due to it being the same granted by my parents who exercise their sacred right to name me. Petitioner states, due to this mistaken identity under the doctrine of item sonans, uh, undesirable situations have occurred, such as from the Roman civil league law and non-English uh, capitalums, words spelled in all cap letters, and capitis uh, dominium maximum, loss of head, uh, that I no longer wish for this threat of confusion, of, of suspension, of fundamental civilian rights to be withheld, damaged, uh, oust, or, dis or extinguished by these misnomers. Under Roman civil laws, 
I have suffered a loss of age of majority civilian rights and so on. But you, it, in, under the doctrine of, uh, you can just tell me when to stop. I'm just reading it. But under the doctrine of age of I have a question for you. Okay. Question for you. So where does your title of nobility name fit into all of this? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I was getting at. Um, so that's how I was coming about to, to try to, basically I was just asking the point of that question was to ask if this would be sufficient, uh, to get, to get the passport, It would the national be. passport. Okay. Um, excellent attempts. Your, your vernacular and your academic is very, very high. But the thing that we have to keep in mind is the birth certificate is the contract that allows them to do what they're doing to us in the first place. And if we don't have a birth certificate, then it's basically the certificate of nationality, right? Or naturalization. The issue is, is that when we're born, you know that after birth DNA material is what they're putting a, a claim on us. That's what they're salvaging. So right. it doesn't matter if you have an all caps name, if you have a lower caps name, if you have last, comma, first, middle, all of it is pertaining to that salvage claim of theirs. Right. And until the actual UCC three has been terminated you're terminating that original agriculture lien that put that that money on that salvage lien and the name change has to be on a name that is it doesn't exist within any state there is no birth certificate for the title of nobility name okay so, so quick question uh like okay so my consort was born here uh she has a birth certificate and so at birth, it's sort of like the question that was asked earlier. I think a lady asked about this, some, some similar, because she got the same name correction as me. We did the same thing. Uh, so on her name, on her name, her last name would be Smith. So we, what we done was uh, her when when she was born, her last name was Smith. Um, that was her mother's maiden name and the mother and father were not married. So um, on her original, because we went and got her original with the feet print, the original documents from the hospital. That we, so we have the original certificate of birth or our certificate of birth um, that shows her blood type that has the, the, the you know, it has the, her mom's maiden name. But what happened is uh, the dad, on the original uh, birth certificate from the um, from that the state has, um, it has the dad's last name, which it was it was granted maybe like three months after she was born. Uh, we tried to see if it was amended, but we we wasn't able to get information based on if it was amended or not. But it shows the father as the informant. Uh, now, what we wanted to know, um, and this would help a lot, is would we be able to go get a name change and use her uh, name change that was on the original hospital record as, uh, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just, you know, you I, get I don't want a name wanna... change on the current birth certificate information that's with vital statistics. Can you repeat that? The birth certificate that you currently have access to that's live and current within vital statistics is the one that you're going to change to your title. Right. Of nobility name. Okay. Now, could that title of no nobility name be the name that's on the original birth certificate that's at the hospital? Or no, no. Okay. The hospital is a federal. Uh, what do they call that? The federal agency. Let's put it that way. And so you you don't want to use that. You need to okay. use something that has no ties to their system. Okay. 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 So use the nobility names that our forefathers and foremothers used prior to 1871 takeover. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. I will. I will do that. I, I, I'm in all the courses, so I'm running through them now. Uh, well, I'm, I'm still. It's going to make sense when I show you the birth announcement information that, and the calendaring. It's going to make sense. Anyway, okay. You'll get it. Okay. And uh, before, well, I have one quick question that I, I just want to. Uh, that was a, a, a large settlement set up for me um years ago um so i was labeled disabled at a certain point but my parents uh because whatever happened to me happened when i was like 17 so at 18 uh it, it, it was actually like three days before i turned 18 um my parents signed um they gave them like a guardianship rights after the settlement, they gave me my guardianship rights back. So they terminated the guardianship rights of the parents, but they did set up a trust, a statutory trust that um, uh, has control over my assets to a certain extent. Like they give me an annuity, but the the they control um, they control the assets. Like as far as the they put a certain amount in a account. Uh, investment account and right. and they managed that now over let's say they lost like two three hundred thousand dollars within a year um and i'm at the point like i stopped receiving the social security uh i just i don't want you know i'm trying to like break that connection right of being disabled and stuff like that so i just stopped receiving those payments and i went to the social security office and kind of made like a declaration sort of kind of uh, but they stopped the payments because what I did was I went abroad I traveled I traveled and, um, and they stopped the payments because they said once I get back to the United States I could give them a call and they would start again but I never I never uh, talked to them after that so what I wanted to know is what would I do because they're managing my assets, but they're like losing money and I really don't have no say so over that. Like to a certain extent. You have to look at the trust document. Who has all the powers? You gotta see exactly what the, trust the trustee can't do. And the trust protector. You know, only uh which uh my mom is like the trust protector, but she's like okay. uh, you know, being Haitian, she kinda it's, no. it's going to be tricky. It's going to be a little bit tricky because, it, like you said, it's a statutory trust. You yeah. Know, you may be listed as one of the beneficiaries, but sometimes the trust may say you got to get all the beneficiaries to vote to change and how the trustees do their investments. It can't just be. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the only beneficiary. It's, it's, a fir, it's a first party, not a third party. So this settlement, it was a large, you know, it was, uh, uh, yeah, I'm the only beneficiary, but the trustees have. It's it's a, a nonprofit trust, and they take like maybe twenty eight thousand, thirty thousand a year. If quarterly, they take like seven thousand every quarter. Uh, and then the investment, the the uh, the investment uh, advisor or not the advisor, yeah, he he takes like maybe five thousand every. They it's like crazy. They take it's in like a lot of money. Or irrevocable. It's irrevocable, and yeah, it's irrevocable. And uh, it's set up for me for the rest of my life or until, you know, 55, 65, 55 or 65. Right. right. I don't think there's much you can do here. Okay. On this one. It's irrevocable. What goes in stays in. You're below 55. You're a beneficiary. The trust protector is the only one that has the rights to terminate how they're doing the investments or, to shift it yeah, around well, and stuff. Well, the trust protector can change the trustee, which is my mom. She's the grantor, so so she can change. She's the grantor and the trust protector. She can change the, uh, which I really don't want. I really I wouldn't want to change the trust. I would want if I if anything I would want to terminate the trust. You know, uh, uh, it, it, like that becoming up the age of majority. You know, uh, but I don't want to. I don't want to uh, close the trust and there's no, I'm setting my, I just did an amendment to set my son up as the heir, as one of the, you know, if something ever happens to me, but I don't want to collapse the trust. And 
So uh, what exactly do you want to do with this trust that's set up? What do you want to do with it? I, I don't want I, I didn't so I don't want another trustee, but mm -hmm. if you get what I'm saying, because the trustee kind of works a lot in my favor, you know, like I own hundreds of acres of land. So it's like they work in my favor, but I don't want to like if I if I don't have this trustee, uh I, I wouldn't want no trustee at all. Put it like that. You know what I mean? But I wouldn't want to change the trustee that I have. So I wouldn't go to my mom and say, hey, look, let's let's get rid of this trustee because the grass might not be green on the other side. You know what I mean? Uh, with another professional trustee, because it has to be a professional trustee. So, you know, uh, I would like to collapse the trust is what I would like to do. So me becoming a private American, though, uh, if I put certain notices in i'm thinking that that would merge the trust the, you know what i mean and i don't want to merge the unless trust there's fraud trust. unless there's fraud you cannot collapse an irrevocable trust okay okay but if they lose three hundred thousand dollars wouldn't wouldn't that be something to look into as far as some type of fraud being done or do you think that it would be just they lost that from the economy from the the stock market theft of three hundred thousand dollars is fraud but not a loss no, not a loss okay correct okay totally mm -hmm. okay thank you so much all right you're welcome no problem. don't worry guys we got time we gotta get through everybody we got time let's go to uh go to aj what's going on aj can you hear me yeah how you doing okay Good day to you. Thank you so much, Avery. Again, you, uh, you've you been such a great teacher for us. And um, I always refer to you often as to how you handle all things um, when, you're, when you're talking to people. And I got to work more on that myself. But my question was regarding the um, enterprise um, bank account. I had set it up. When I did this, I said it was set up with the EIN number and, but it's not set up as a, it was not set up as a business account. It was as if it was set up as a, almost like a personal account, but with still, it has the enterprise name on it, the enterprise names that we, that we created. So. If I was to build credit, how can I how can I build some credit underneath the EIN number since it's not a I guess viewed as a um, business by the by the bank and it's Wells Fargo. Right. One second here. I get you the answer you need. Let's see if we have a. Uh good one here who can uh, help answer that question right. immediately I can't find you Jay are you there weigh in on this one building credit the yeah I'm here you. you can still build credit on it because the credit is even though it's under the personal even though they open it as a personal account at the end of the day it still has a uh a EIN number and when you build a credit you build it on the EIN number it's not your social so it doesn't matter how they open the account what matters is what are you using it for to apply for that we report to the EIN what business credit company you're using what prepaid card you're using that reports on the business is all going to go to the EIN number not your personal so it doesn't matter how the bank open it or how they classify it so is there any any type of uh, recommendation as to what would be the easiest tier one, uh, you know, that we can go for right away? Let me let me also add to uh, that is that currently I am my mother's uh, caregiver. And so since she lives with me, IHSS doesn't take out any taxes and it's not considered income. So... How, how do we handle this? How do I build this when none of my, none of what I'm making is considered income? 
as what as far as connecting that to business credit wise? Well, when you're filling out applications for credit, they want to know income. So all right. So if you look in the small print, whether it's personal or business, mm -hmm. when you're a startup, when you start from day one, when you get to the part where it says income, it's not it's it's uh what's the word I'm looking for? It's um projected income. Okay. And it's also household income and totality and everything goes into that number that you put there. Uh -huh. So, okay. and then also anytime you put money into a bank account, it's automatically perceived as income. Any money that go into a bank account is perceived as income. How you differentiate that later is when you file your tax returns and you say, oh no, this was debt or this was that, or this was this, or this was that. Because if, if you learn anything in a class, income is what is what get taxed. So okay. anything that's categorized as income is what get taxed. Okay. Depreciation, all that type of stuff like that, where there was, um, for instance, I could put $100,000 in a bank account, in my bank account, and it's going to be perceived as income until the end of the year when I say, no, I loaned my business $100,000. So now that 100000 becomes debt. So now it's not taxable. So anything you put in your bank account is income. Okay. Until you say it's not. All right. Mm -hmm. So what should I apply for to to get credit on uh, my credit? Uh, if, new you credit already at, if you already have Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo has a business secured uh, credit card that you can do that probably be the easiest first step. And it's a relationship based because you already did. So when I talk to the lady who helped me out, set the stuff up, she says that we didn't turn in paperwork as a business. So maybe she's not as familiar with how this works, or maybe I'm not understanding this, but again, I didn't, I, even though I did the EIN number, we didn't file any paperwork saying what kind of business. Cause that's yeah, that. Now I remember she was saying, are you a sole proprietorship or your corporation? We didn't, we didn't say none of those things because we didn't set it up as a business. So what do I do in that situation? Well, you can work it two ways. Cause I, where mine's at too, is under the, under the personal side too. But when I, my merchant accounts, anything I do that's connected to that bank account is still categorized as a business, even though they have it listed as a personal. So a workaround that you could do is you can create another LLC that that trust owns and then you can function from that LLC, almost like the trust enterprise. Mm -hmm. But you can do an LLC and connect it to it and you get the same benefits, but it, it releases, you have to jump over all of those hurdles. And then that's the one that you could build credit on. And then that's somewhere down the line, if it don't work out for you or don't end up going how you want it or it's not making you no money, you can dissolve it. And it has no direct reflection on the foreign trust if you do it in there or the enterprise if you do it underneath there. Could I use um, what what Avery has told us to do before, which is use a um, unincorporated association instead? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I guess I have to go study that again to see how to create the paperwork. Is there is there since it's been a while since I looked at that, Avery? Do you have there all the paperwork that we need? in connection, like all the, all the wording that we need to put into the unincorporated association. Nothing has changed. And it was based off of California, which that's the state you're in. Yes. It'll work for you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much, Avery. Appreciate you. And that, Thank and, you. That, and that, and that bypasses the BOI requirements too. If you do it under a UA too. FYI. Man. Um, also fins in, right? Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. So if I need to talk to you again, how would I, under what name do I look? In this, the, uh, this J, AJ. J. But I mean, I, I'm not in, in the, in the, um, it's J. Just J. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'll look for you there. I'll talk to you soon. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Avery. All right. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Thanks. Jay. Thanks. Okay, we're going to flex. Hey, Avery. Hey, man. How's it going, TZP family? Um, 
So look, man, <laughs> you know, I always got some stuff going on. So I, I guess my biggest question is when, if, if I didn't assert my trust in a situation, let's say like a private arbitration, and there's potentially a judgment um, that they have to get through through the court system. Am I then able at all in any possible way to uh, use my trust to protect my person at all in that particular situation? Or is it like a too late situation? Good question. Um, in the case you didn't mention anything about the trust, you probably just, it was just you versus them. And then you're getting close to the end and you want to use the trust for protection is what you're asking, right? Um, Correct. Yeah, I think I think pretty much the judgment's probably gonna get awarded against me. So now I'm just trying to see before they run to the court to get the, the actual judgment from the court outside of the arbitration. Is there anything I could do with the trust? Yeah, yeah. What I would do is put on the record the express trust doing business as your full birth name. Um, that that always needs to go in there. You know, even though you're the defendant or the plaintiff as your full birth name, that should always go in there to show, look. This is who you're really dealing with here. Um, so put that okay. in order. Also, let's see if you got your DBA showing that for the trust doing business full birth name, then that would lead to an actual appeal. An appeal. I also put in the copyright notice and also put in the schedule of fees from your trustee minutes. So the okay, schedule of fees will cool. show, yeah, yeah. The schedule of fees will okay. will show as a counter to whatever amount they're gonna try to go ahead and put against you. So if they're utilizing your name on the documentation, which we say is anything over twenty thousand dollars, if the amount that they're trying to come at you for is let's say four thousand, well, we have a negative swap. Got you. That way I can use it to discharge. Correct. Okay. That's how I would attack that. Okay. Yeah. And should I wait till they file the judgment or should I go ahead and file something ahead of time? Ahead of time. Ahead of okay. time. Okay. Just like make my own little case or something. You file it right within the same case. Just put the DBA in there. Let them know it's there. Okay. Okay. I appreciate it. That's pretty much the premise of my question. Okay. All right. It's good to hear from you. Good to hear from you as well. Well, now we're going to head to uh, Mo Siam. You are muted. How are you doing, Avery? I'm good, sir. Thank you. Good. Um, my question is regards uh, to 1040 and 1041 and just like overall how to file your taxes every year. Um, when I started this process, uh, I run a business, so my, my CPA has me paying like quarterly taxes. So when I started this, I, I, I stopped, right? So I didn't pay fourth quarter and I haven't filed my 2023 yet because I don't know what's like the right way to go. Like, can I still get that money back? Um, or do I want to still show like a high 1040 income so that I could still have access to like business lines of credit and loans and refinance and stuff like that? Yeah, you will still file your 1040 as usual. Okay. You know, if, if you're not, and you're your own business, man. So if nobody is withholding anything, you do it yourself quarterly. So at that point, it's going to incorporate. <clears throat> Uh, additional forms, like I mentioned, the gift tax uh, form 709. Um, and like what Jay said, the money that you earn, you can you can loan that out to a, another business or you can loan it out to a tax exempt trust. Right. So therefore, the entire thing is now uh, no longer a liability. No, it's not even an asset. It's just a debt. Right. So, there are, there's tactics, but you know, you still want to file the basic 1040, which allows you to still apply for loans and credit in the future. But it's those additional schedules that will help remove the tax liability when you're using a social or proprietor. Right. Uh, are you 
to be doing classes on that or any type of in-depth or is that for consultation like how do we learn how to do that process um a lot of people have been asking for it for quite some time now and i wanted to have um live cases to present that information to which i have so okay. it's going to be coming it's going to be coming in this year i'll be okay. showing you how to do do it for situations where if you're an employer uh, an employee who's withheld you right. didn't do exempt vice versa you kept your money what do you do when they say you owe and then for the business owner who has 1120 forms or 990ts right there'll be scenarios for that I'll, I'll show that for sure okay okay good do you, do you think we'll be able to do that before the Tax I want to be able to get that for, to you guys before April because I know that's a deadline for extensions. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Okay, that's awesome. All right. Um, I don't really have any other like major. I mean, I guess I have a small one also about taxes, which is like sales tax. Um, do we try to get that refunded like at the end of the year, or um, you know, what do you do with just regular sales tax? Right. So if we have your express trust set up doing business in the name of the business name, uh -huh. that would mean the foreign express trust is the one who paid the tax. Right. right. Yeah. So it's a simple form. Uh, what is that? 843. Where Eight. they will claim, list that down as a fee to get paid. And that goes for mortgage interest. That goes for vehicle interest. All that stuff is done in 843. Okay. The actual Foreign Express Trust is the one who puts in the claim for the refund, not the business. Okay. So that would be on like a 1041 form or? No, nope, just 43. And then put in your 98 EIN. Correct. For refund. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. How you back it up? A few forms that goes along with it because when you send in the A43, they're asking for a computation sheet or some type of explanation. Yeah. So this means that you have a trademark and license agreement between the trust giving the licensee uh, rights over to that business name to do business. Yes, okay. I have that. Do you have a, a lien on that business? Yes, we have that. All yeah. of that goes together. Okay. Yeah, I, I would assume that hopefully there's a class coming for this. Um or just some more detail or consultation, I'm, I'm open to that. So I could start filing. I pay a lot of sales tax because I'm in e-commerce and then my other business is real estate. So, um, you know, I just, I'm trying to figure it all out, especially with real estate. I don't want to like write off the ability to refinance or get a loan or something like that, you know? Correct. Yeah. 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 A couple of us are in real estate as well. We understand. Right. Good. All right. Thanks, Xavier. I appreciate you, man. You're welcome. All right. Going to, uh, let's go with Omizen. How do we say that? You are muted. I, um, actually, um, Frenchie and Lou V has been answering my questions in the chat. So we, we pretty much, they've been getting it done, but I do appreciate your time. Thank you. All right, cool. Welcome. Thank you, Frenchie, for taking care of that. Going to Lou. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hey, man. How you doing? Good. How you doing? Trying to make time for you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, hey, brother. I'm going to pass it on. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sitting yeah, back okay, eating popcorn. I'm sorry. Go ahead. We got some things to get to this month, right? Yes, we do, brother. All right. And it's good to see Yoda in the building. Yeah, yeah. We're glad that he's back. back About time here. he's back, right? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't never left. I ain't never left. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, happy Saturday to everybody. I'm going to sit back and just keep listening. I'll give it to somebody else because I, you know my situation, so I'd rather give it to someone else. I got you. No Take care, brother. Take care, Yoda. All right. Samuelson, you are unmuted. Hi, Avery. How you doing? 
I'm all right. I got to answer to my question about the Trust Enterprise account uh, from Frenchy. Thank you for that. I had another question. Mm -hmm. I am a part of a, I'm an elected to a steering committee for a decentralized organization, a DAO. Uh, we spent the past year uh, taking on the assets uh, from the founding team that that stopped working on on the project that we formed around. So we have all the the uh, smart contracts and the website and all that intellectual property. We've talked about forming an entity for the DAO. Uh, we have a, an uh, operating model that we follow uh, and that kind of outlines our structure in general, but we want to become a trust. And so I see two paths ahead of us. Um, one, we could start this process for, for something that would never have a birth certificate. And then the chairperson of the steering committee would, would be the, the U S person. And we have, we have foreign people, uh, in, in the organization. In mm -hmm. fact, my, my foreign trustee comes from there. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I did when I formed mine, uh, when I formed mine with my trustee, who is a part of this community, uh, mm -hmm. is in my DBA, in the personal correspondence, I said that I, that the trust was uh, potentially uh, doing business as the the DAO uh, in question. Mm -hmm. So they already approved that. Can I have uh, the chairperson open up an enterprise trust and then 8832 to my express trust and plenipotentiary power uh, uh, make a contract uh, so that all of the responsibility for the DAO would be handled by that enterprise trust that he's, uh, that he's controlling, uh, as the chairperson for the DAO. Excellent. Indeed. That's all I got to say. I can't. You can. All right. So then that's, that's probably going to save about six months of time because then I don't have to, uh, we don't have to form a, a 98 for a DAO and and use a separate trustee i i can okay yeah that that makes a lot of sense because i could already enforce it because they gave me the 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 letter uh confirming that i don't have a tax filing requirement for the express trust so if we just uh 8832 the new entity uh we, we should be good and then would i be able to bring uh other aspects of my trust into whatever county let's say south dakota we did for the uh for the Dow, and would it still be a grat? It will, it will still be a grat when it comes to banking. You can bring it into any state that you want, as long as you have the proper DBA there, or just stating the addresses. Let's say you filed it here in um, Seminole County, Florida, but the business is in uh, South Dakota. Well, I want you to pick, you're gonna have a headquarters address, you have a principal address, and you have a mailing address. That's how you keep that uniform. But right. yes, you can do all of that. Okay, cool. And and you definitely uh, you outlined that in one of your previous junior course classes where you where you introduced the uh, the headquarters idea. Now, if I if I already have a DBA statement uh, that was filed that was uh, circulated in the newspaper, and then I want to file it miscellaneous in my county, but I didn't specify that the headquarters. Uh, if I wanted to add a headquarters in the future in a different state, I would just have to circulate a new statement and file that. You would. A new publication. Yeah. Got it. Got it. All right. Thank you for your time, Avery. I uh, really appreciate all the work you do. Thank you so much. Appreciate the brainstorming. CJ, how you doing, man? Hey, Avery. How you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, I got you. All right. Um, I'm trying to see where should I start. Right, I got a couple of questions, but I know you say you kind of want us to kind of tell a little bit about where we at in the process as well. So okay, yeah. So I'll start with that. Um, since I, I met with you, I got a couple of different things um, done. Um, as far as starting with the trust, you know, the 98, I got all that stuff done. I got my 8832s back for a domestic trust, uh, um, my corporations, and um, working on one for my LLC in Wyoming. 
Um, I got my domestic trust open and I also have my brokerage under that trust as well. Um, I'm currently working on a couple of things right now as far as um, I'm doing my trust. <clears throat> So when I originally did my land trust, um, they rejected my UCC. Uh, um, they was asked for certain documents and I don't know if I mailed the documents in on time, but I saw that it got terminated. So I redid it um, yesterday, two of them yesterday, it got accepted, but I, I didn't do it in Illinois, I did it um, in another state or something so i got that done so i guess my question is once i that was a non uc redid do i need to do um a uc uh ucc one just to, to notify that of them of that land trip or just just refile it in the county with the new ucc i just did and leave it at that no, you you actually don't even need to do a UCC three when it comes oh, to that. Oh, mm. All right. Um, like when it comes to the land trust, because it doesn't need an EIN taxes or anything like that, it's just a holding entity for the property. Um, when when you do a sale, people start to I mean uh, people. Title companies, that's where they're going to see that land trust document. Maybe they need to see some proof of it to verify where where does the money need to go to as far as a beneficiary. But it's optional. The non-UCC partner reflecting the land trust is optional. Why? Because when you go down to the county and when you put a property into a land trust, you can essentially just use their standard little conveyance form that they have they just put one two three main street land trust here's the trustee and when you're recording it yes bring in the actual declaration of the trust so they can see okay this is a real thing this is this is this it exists and then they'll go ahead and do it but that doesn't mean you have to record the entirety of the land trust in the county records so with that being said therefore a non-UCC or UCC one does not have to be on the property at all. How I do it, I put one, two, three Main Street Land Trust. My trustee is going to be either a 501c3 corporation for tax exemption purposes for property taxes, or it's going to be some uh, New Mexico LLC. No one knows who the managers are of it, or maybe a Delaware corporation or an unincorporated association. All of those work to my favor. That's who's going to be listed as a trustee for the property. I do plan on most likely Airbnb it, renting it out, or just having it as a vacation piece of property. And if I want to sell it, I can sell it. I didn't have it in the full express trust where it can kind of cause some conflicts there. That's how I would do it. Okay. All right. Okay. So I already filed it. I filed it in the county already, but the UCC had got rejected. So you saying it's fine. So I don't Even necessarily alone. have to go and be okay. All right. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So the the next thing I was working on <laughs> is with my babies, right? Because I have my baby's home birth. So it's still working on identification um for them. So I did do the the birth um, announcement and I, I filed it in a newspaper. And I think um, Frenchy helped me with this, but we did it in, I think it was Florida, mm -hmm. um, at the, uh, a newspaper out there. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was reading the part where it says, um, I guess when you go file it in the county, go file the newspaper, uh, publication in the county at the records office it right. says or uh, any county, but preferably the same county that we did with the newspaper that was in um florida so i but i can do it in illinois though because i'm kind of uh, familiar with filing stuff in the county here mm -hmm. that should be okay right yes it is you can file your birth announcement right. 
anywhere. Hmm. Okay. Anywhere. You guys want to see? And so when I go found that in the county, uh, we I think French, she kind of asked you about this. Just wanted to use this opportunity to ask again. Should I do it as for them to actually file it in, in the county? What document do I need? And I think we said something about, um, I can't think of the name of it right now, but because uh, I did it before the domicile. Do I file a domicile with that for them to file it in the county? For the children or article? If it's a birth announcement, it's just a simple affidavit. If if you're referring to the offspring lease agreement, I have that form. You guys grab it off the site and then you add it with the non-UCC, I'm sorry, UCC3, which is an amendment to the parent's existing express trust. So if that express trust was filed on a non-UCC in Chicago, Illinois, and you're having troubles doing any further stuff there, you can still do your UCC3 pertaining to that UCC that you did in, in Chicago in another state. All you do is reference the referencing number in line box one, and that's how you connect it. It's all about full faith and credit. It really is. But yeah, oh, I'm trying to... Yes, affidavit. I'm sorry. I I'm sorry. I missed that. Affidavit of domicile is for your children's authenticated birth certificate. Okay. Right. They don't have a birth certificate. Okay. So they don't have one. Here's what, you, what I want you to do. You, your next best thing is just a birth announcement. So you can do that in wherever you're comfortable with doing it. Find a local newspaper. They're called a, a periodical. Put the announcement in that newspaper. Let it circulate. Once you get the publication uh, back, take it and go get it authenticated on every level of government. Once you're done with that, place it into your trust. And it has an expiration until they are 18 21, whichever you feel is best. And then they'll take that document and put it into their trust when they're of age. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so I think I understand that part of it. Um, it was just when I go take this publication to county to have them file it, the paperwork in the county. I just need an affidavit of birth, right? That's what you're saying. And as a cover letter, and they, they should file it in there. And so once I get that, I'm asking for them to give me a, a certified letter, right? And so then I'm taking that certified letter or document to the state to get it authenticated, correct? Once you have the birth announcement already done in the newspaper, you got to go into the county and find out what section are they going to put it in. They may not even have an affidavit section. Some some don't. And they may just call it a miscellaneous section. Either or is fine. Right. Tell them you want to record it right. in either, either one of them. And then tell the clerk, can you give me a certified copy of it? Cool, you got it. Mm. I'll take it to the Secretary of State. He authenticates and take that to the Department of State on form 4194. They authenticate. Now you're done. Now, here's the cool part. Let's say you want yeah. to get so one step further and you want to go get them a passport. Yes, that was next. Right? So let's say you want to get them the passport. Um in a name that is not associated with anything in the in the public system. They already have a name in the public school system. Let's say you want them to have a different name, like a title nobility under you. 
So you have to know that first. They're not in the system, though. <laughs> They're homeschool, right? So what I do to um, DS10? Hmm? I was just getting to that. Yeah, so. Okay, you're all right, all right. DS10. <laughs> yeah. The, mm. So the birth announcement with the DS10. Um, and then, of course, they need to have some form of ID. But since they're under 16, they're not going to have an ID. That's where you come in. And then you know, they should be able to get a passport with that without having to provide a birth certificate. Now, here's the kicker. On the application, it's going to ask for their social security number. You don't want them to have that. But this is why the, the, there's so many little steps, intricate steps that have to take place before you apply. Do, do your children have a birth certificate, uh, a social security number right now? No. Mm -mm. You are mm. rare, a rarity. Most people have <laughs> all these issues. I know we really was trying to like, you know, how I'm born free. And so I just wanted to make sure, like, if I still want to operate for certain things or programs and stuff for them, that if I could just provide some type of ID, whether it was like a school program or, you know, educational program coding that they needed some type of identification that I was able to provide that. And so that's why I'm, I'm going about it this way. Wow. Yeah, you you you're doing big things. No social, no birth certificates. They're completely ghost from the system, and they're they they have no uh, there's no lack of want in their lives. So that's really really good. That's the model that everyone should go for for those that don't have children and and plan to. And so you know those that do, there are little intricate steps that we have to follow. That information will come. I, I kind of broke it down a little bit just now, but it's coming and you'll see it all. So, so by doing that, it says a it says a no statement to show that there is no birth certificate. By going on through all that, that's proven that there is no birth certificate um, by doing the authentication and all that stuff, right? So I can kind of like skip over that, that part. Yeah, since there's no birth certificate to authenticate, um, you don't have to do that, of course, but you still want to authenticate the birth announcement, like we just said. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay. That's it. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. All right. And it, this won't be a problem if I haven't corrected my name yet, right? Like, if I haven't did a name change for me, it shouldn't be a problem for now. Right. Nope. I'm going to share my screen right, for a minute. Cool. This is the end of the segment. Uh, some of you, I'm going to cut this off in the actual part so that only you guys can see this. <laughs> my birth announcement. Patrice Glenn Elder, mother and birthing person gave birth to a single male. You see how my title nobility name is there? Mm. When you list the parents such as for yourself, you can put your title nobility name there instead of your birth certificate name. You can get that already started because you know that eventually when you do your name change, it's going to be that name anyway. Right. So you don't have to put the birth name right now on your child's birth announcement. Now, everybody has seen my documents. They know I wasn't born December 16, 1988. It's November 8, 1987. Gregorian. This is Julian. Whole nother ballgame. You have to get away from all of the tax and tri uh, tricks that they put on you. That born alive person that I was talking about. But I'll show it. We will show it and break it down so it can make sense. So you can understand where we were with the birth certificate system and where we are going. Completely separate from that. I can truly say that's not me. I don't know who that person is. In fact, that person has a death certificate. 
that's a major major joke but it, it'll make sense thank later. you thank you it'll make sense later thank you. so now if that was if you, if you don't have anything further we have two more hands but um any other questions cj um last one i just wanted to make sure i heard this correctly it, did um, AJ say that we can build credit with our domestic trust? We can build credit with the domestic trust, such as the social security number, right? Because um, I have the domestic trust account open. I, I wanted to know if I heard him correctly that he said that we actually can build with that just off the EIN alone. Yeah, you can. He he mentioned that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, how I've done it, I haven't necessarily taught this for most people because they weren't ready for it, but I tell everybody to set up your trust enterprise account personal. So that way you can just still do your day-to-day -day banking as you normally are used to and still be protected but for those of you that have businesses go to another bank with the same trust enterprise EIN let me figure out where that is there we go mm -hmm. that noise um, I go to another bank truest bank took the same trust enterprise EIN that I have with Wells Fargo set up the certification trust to reflect as a business now and still under grant um but this time i'm not the trustee i use an actual company as the trustee as long as i have a dba that says trust enterprise doing business as that company That company, whoever is the manager of it, which can change at any time, and I can have an unlimited numerable number of managers, can walk into the bank, deposit the money that's made out to the name of the trust or the business. I can have the manager walk in and make withdrawals. Just call them up and tell them, I need you to do such and such for me. That's how you would connect and make this now a business a business account versus a personal. So yes, either way, like Jay said, you can bill credit on the trust EIN number. Unless you default, then of course, that's when the social security information is gonna be used because that's the guarantor if you default. Yeah. Okay, Very awesome. Very awesome. Yeah, because we didn't have to use our social security security number to open the account so it was like complete we was completely separated from it so gotcha gotcha mm -hmm. all right cool all right i appreciate that well, man. thank you well thank you i appreciate you all right going to adrian who are you just have to unmute your microphone Adrienne, are you there? Are you with us? No? Okay, I'll come back. Go to... Uh, I may be pronouncing this wrong. I'm not going to even say it. Just go ahead. <laughs> so, it, it's Nikki, but it's actually this is actually Nikki's husband, Adam. Oh, uh, Adam, uh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I, I have a question about... I'm a, I work in a union... I work uh, under a union, and so uh, uh, under our collective bargaining agreement, uh, I make uh, currently seventy dollars an hour on the check, and I have like around thirty-two or thirty-three dollars an hour that goes into other things like a four hundred one k, a pension, medical, a defined benefit, all this, all this extra stuff. Is there a way to? Um, 
to communicate and to get the money that's going into all this stuff that I don't want the money in just on the check that you know of. So are you saying you want to stop all of that? I'm saying I want that, that I, I don't, you know, I, I don't like the medical. I'd rather get my own medical. If I want to get my own medical, I'd oh. rather, I'd rather not have a 401k. I'd rather have the money in other, other funds than a 401k right. because the 401k is obviously an IRS fund, right? So, right. and, yeah. Is the union forcing you to do that? Well, the the the, the collective bargaining agreement says we'll get sixty nine ninety nine on the check. Well, the the collective bargaining agreement. It's kind of interesting. The collective bargaining agreement. Uh, we get raises, and then as a union, we vote on how to to allocate those raises. Right. So we have one coming up in February that's going to be about three dollars and fifty cents. So we're going to allocate like two dollars and ten cents to the check, and then another dollar forty two. Some of it will probably go to medical. Some of it will go to uh, the pension, that kind of stuff. Gotcha. So <laughs> I, I would rather not participate in that stuff. I'd rather just get all the money on the check and then allocate it how I want to. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Uh, just check with your HR. Have you checked with them yet to see if are you mandated to participate because of the union contract? Just check with that first. If not, then tell them to give you the necessary forms to stop it. And okay. update W4 to put exempt on there to collect all your monies. And yeah, the yeah, I got to gotta, yeah, I gotta get the trust and stuff all set up first. I'm hopefully going to bang that out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, most of it, anyway. Right, I can't do all of it all at once, obviously. But um, gotcha. Good job. Yep. yep, I'm in the process of doing it. So I'm excited. Okay. So, yeah, my wife. Yeah, Nikki. Nikki is ahead of me on that. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay, I'll remember that next time. Uh, one last thing for you: when you go and check with HR, double check if they first got you in under the W four, or if they got you in as a W nine. I'm hoping W nine. It's it's a W four. It's ah. pretty standard, right? They, um, because it's all done through the social. Right at this point, why? Well, and I don't, I don't think that necessarily matters in terms of the W four or the W nine, but it's 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 a W four because it's because I'm not an independent contractor, right? I go I go to a I'm in a union, but I go to I take a call and then I go to that company, and yeah, I'm, I'm I'm employed by that company. I'm not employed by the union per se. I pay dues and stuff, but I'm not employed. By Essentially, that's an individual contractor, but uh, they're not going to okay. classify you that way. There's one telltale. Uh, if you look on your W-2 that you received, uh, there's a section, I think, number 13. It says if you are a statutory employee, I'm most surely that you are, it's blank. Or it says statutory employee. And there's only three industries that are considered a statutory employee. One is selling life insurance. Um, second is something to do with delivery of uh, specific items. And I know that's none of those are yours. So that's, mm -hmm. that's really evidence from the IRS that you are an independent contractor. You're not a statutory okay. employee. Gotcha. But, yeah. So that's box 13 on the W on the W-2, you said? W-2. I think it's box 13. Just look for statutory employee. Okay. So if it, doesn't, if it doesn't say that, if it doesn't say statutory employee, then I should be able to fill out W-9. Yeah, yeah, correct. If it's blank, you really uh, should be giving them a W-9. But are they accepted? Who knows? Every employer is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm an electrician. I work for an electrical contractor, but I've been told that it's actually owned by the company is actually owned by a group of attorneys, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah, that is interesting. It might change the modus operandi of the, of the company and how they operate versus other contractors. So, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Avery. I appreciate it. All right. You're welcome. Thanks, Avery. You're welcome. All right, we'll be back to Adrian. You ready to go? 
Hi, Avery. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. But anyway, okay. I don't, I'm not sure what part I'm in. I really just um, joined uh, some weeks ago and I bought the complete course. Okay. okay. So um, my question is, and forgive me, I mean, I've been through all the courses and I'm still trying to understand everything. So forgive me if you've already answered this, but I have a question about the name. Okay. Um, right now, we're existing, well, I'm existing, I'm, from my understanding, I'm existing in the private and public world. I'm using the straw man and the title of nobility, correct? So I want to know is once I finish the 0%, the whole program, will I cease to use my straw man name and just use the, my title of nobility for everything? Does that make sense? I don't know if I'm it saying It makes anything. perfect, perfect sense. In the very beginning of a process such as this, um, you may not be ready to fully move on to using the title of nobility name in every sense of commerce. You may not be ready to do that. Okay. So this process is set up to it where it protects yourself and it shows a clear distinction between the debtor side and the creditor side, creditor side, both sides, the debtor side and the creditor side is no longer going to be under the trust territory of the United States, but it will now be under the um, power of the express trust, the one that you have. So if you continue to use, let's say your name and the social security number for financing, you are still able to do that. Just know a part of the process you've stated in the passport process, you stated that you are uh, not a United States citizen, but a national. If you use that social security number, you're saying that you are. Okay. So what that means is you have to keep track of every time you do that. Keep track of every time you use that social. So that way you can produce a trustee minute, which is basically a declaration of nationality. And you're going to put that in the paper so that there, that way there is no presumption. So if you finish this process tomorrow, and then in two weeks from tomorrow, you go and get a car in the social security name. The very next day, you need to put a trustee minute in the paper and say, I declare I'm not a U.S. citizen. I am such and such. That way you you have to clear out that presumption of evidence that you are a U.S. citizen. And I want you to do that every time you use it up until you're ready to use your title of nobility name. Now, how do you build up the title of nobility name? You have the name change. You've done that process. You went ahead and you've got the birth announcement taken care of. You have your United States passport in the new name. Then you went and got a private driver's license from the DMV in the new name with no social security number. Those two things, you've taken care of a lot right there. At that point in time, when it comes to credit, you want to build business credit. Build business credit to the point to where you don't have to give the social security number or any type of guarantor to back it up. Okay. Okay. And once you have all those done, when you, you have credit worthiness, you can say, okay, I can walk away from the social security name and the number. I don't need it anymore. So there's well, steps. It's a process. If we were born into this, then of course our parents would have done this for us for the, for the 18 years of life. And then we'll be ready to go into commerce the right way. Now we're, it's, we're going backwards. We're trying to correct it. Okay. okay. Makes sense. Yeah, it, it makes sense. So, um, even after the name change, we, from um, what I'm hearing from you, we're trying to get away from using the social security number. So that means that we're not trying to do a 
once we do our name change, we're not trying to change our social security, the name in the social security number, right? No, Let's... no. We do okay, not do, okay. we do not change the birth certificate to the title of nobility name, and we do not update our existing social security number with the title of nobility name. We don't do that. Okay, that's that, is, right. that would defeat the purpose. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, okay. Okay. Um, well, that makes sense. Thank you very much. And thank you for all you do. And I wanted to tell you this before I get off that I read your book for a whole year before I even knew you had a course. And also I tried, I, I did my first birth certificate um, through just your free information from me before I even did the course. And I just got it back last week. So I'm I'm overjoyed. Thank you. That's amazing. So I have you. I have nine more to go. <laughs> so yes. thanks. Yes. That's that's amazing <laughs> to hear um, that they're sending them back to you. And that's that's pretty that's good timing. How long did it take you to get it back? You know what? It took five weeks. The fourth week he signed off on it. The next week I had it because you know they were saying, oh, it's four months, and this. I was like. I claimed it before it happened. I was like, I'm not waiting seven weeks. I'm not waiting four months. They're going to send me my stuff back. So I kind of like visualized it coming back and it worked. It's like, I'm, mm -hmm. baby, you just don't know how excited I am. <laughs> you just don't know. I mean, because I've been on this journey for like my whole life almost. And I found you and I'm excited. I'm sorry, guys. I don't want to take up too much time, but thank you. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Perfectly fine. The floor is yours. <laughs> got any more to say? Uh, we like we like hearing testimonies and uh, seeing you guys' success and being excited about the process. That yeah. Was me and I'm I'm still going with it, and I'm excited about where all of us are going to go. That's oh. the thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. Let me ask. Uh, so we have Frenchie, Jay, Isaiah, you guys are here. Any announcements that you guys want to state before we go? No, no just I'm... happy to be here. Oh, Isaiah, you there? You good? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, nothing. Just enjoying okay. the class. Anything new in the, uh, the injunction world? processes with paper filings nothing like that we good uh the only update with the injunctions is hold on give it one second <clears throat> it's just a, cho a choice of uh having it published in the paper or doing it the traditional way that we've been doing it since day one um i would say the paper uh, publishing the injunction in the paper is a little bit more costly, but you could probably shop it around and find it cheaper uh, than the than what the initial cost is. Because I know it's around seven hundred dollars for <clears throat> the the heritage, yeah. um, and the traditional way is about I think it's about three hundred and something dollars. Yeah. The registered mail way, mm -hmm. the the th the three the three waves, right, right. So yeah, that's, that's what we're talking yeah. about. Uh, we we've been doing our injunctions through the newspaper as well, because they will tie it directly to the court, and so that means you have an active case number. That's good. So you can take that case number that's connected to the paper, which is connected to the court, and apply it to the actual injunction. If you guys recall in the in the course, the senior course, there's a section in your injunction where you actually make your own equitable case number. And so we've taken that number that's from the newspaper and placed it there. So you have a direct case number. And it's optional. Of course, it's gonna cost a little bit more money, but I think it's uh it's worth it. So, yeah, thank you for reminding me about that, Isaiah. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So as we were signing off, we got a few more. I'll go ahead and 
give you the floor. Going to uh, Buddy. Who is Buddy One? Your hand is raised. Just got to unmute your mic. Buddy One. Oh, can you hear me? Uh, a little bit. Okay, I can speak up a little bit. Um, it's very nice to meet you. This is my first time here. I've been in the classes for a while. I have two letters back stating I don't have to pay any tax for the Express Trust and the Identity Enterprise. I just finished up my third letter to send off again for the state. And my question is, um, I have a injunction place for, I mean, a judgment placed on me through the court of through the county, and it's common uh, the municipal uh, civil court for a alleged third party debt collector that I actually have seated in. They have been removed before any of this. They were removed from my um, from my grant union and I experienced all three of those, and they've never been allowed back onto the court against me. So I, I, I got the judgment in the mail, and they said they had put an entry in my in the docket that said that I had received the summons, and that I was sent back to them on the plane. But I never received it, and then I went and did the tracking number on it, and it's still out actually. To this day, uh, on, still not for delivery. So the fraudulent, an inaccurate, at minimum, uh, entry, which I put some letters together for me, well, a letter stating that I think that according to the uh, judge to make a, an error that they have not given me my due process, should I go to that court to file an objection, grievance, or, or or should, I, or should I just go straight to the circuit court um, to, to place that um, objection of judgment against me? Oh, it's, I kind of got what you were what you're saying because we have bad signal. It's cutting um, really bad, but I, what, I, what I've gathered is there is a case against you potentially uh, uh, some form of debt collection, and uh, you're seeking to maybe think about uh, in implementing an injunction against them for a wrongdoing that they have done. And the only yeah. way to get a, a permanent injunction done or a temporary injunction done is if you can prove that there has been an event of irreparable injury that was done from them to you in the would case. that constitute them putting a fraudulent or inaccurate uh entry on my docket i printed off the the uh from fedex that states that it's, that it's still out for delivery that it's never been sent to me then they then i, I actually called and i talked to this lady and she said that they can send something out um, and and it doesn't even have to be signed for. Well, I went to the rules of civil procedure here in Ohio, and the rule says that it has to be left. It has to be left with like a neighbor, which I live in a building, and we're all look out for each other. But um, it could be left somewhere visible. It could be signed by somebody other than me or signed by me, and uh, that never came either. I never got that. No and. Nothing has ever been left, and none of the neighbors have seen anything or been approached by. And we, and we know our, our uh, delivery people from Amazon, FedEx, and Postal Service. So, would that be something irreparable because they put the judgment against me? And they that's a, that's a copyright infringement because I have that. Yes, it is. It's lack of due process. Under, and lack of process. I put those under Rule 12, there. that's the federal rule, but I'm sure your state has codified it uh, as the same thing. Rule 12, lack of due process, lack of service of process, all of those things. And then should I take it to the actual civil 
uh, the county civil um, administrative board. I actually reference them as administrator. And mm -hmm. should I to the uh, Fifth Circuit Court, which is, again, it's just like a different building down now in the same county. Here. You first want to put your cross claim. All right, I'm sorry, your your motion for your demand for dismissal. That's what this is. It's the demand for dismissal, according to all those rules in Rule 12. First, put that in the affidavit format and then file it in the local newspaper. And then take that publication and file it into the exact court where the offense is taking place. First, do it there. Because you can't just go to a higher up court unless there's been a determination in the lower court. Oh, I have to uh, make my grievance to them and then we make another decision. And then if I don't agree with that, then I go to the higher court. Okay. Correct. Okay. All right. And then is this for the dismissal? Demand for dismissal? Correct. Demand for okay. dismissal. Okay. Um, thank you. I, I I actually also have uh, a grant, or I mean, my godson, he's in uh, prison. They've had him since May. They have sent him they, for two cases, and they never let him see any evidence. One they threw out, and then this other one, um, he was found innocent by jury, and then they scooped him up and took him to this ADA which I guess is parole. I'm not familiar with all these things, but now that I'm learning all of this, I'm getting a lot more familiar, but... They had a warrant? So yeah, so it's with this parole board, and now they want to try him again for the very crime that he was found innocent with the, with the jury of his peers. And this is making no sense to me at all, and I just wondered if there was anything that I could do for him. Yes, there is. You have to enforce the Constitution. This is double jeopardy. Can I have yeah. And he even had, I mean, he does have a private lawyer. They won't let him go sue me juris or pro se. And his his uh, attorney objected and they said they didn't care. I mean, literally, that's what they said. And well, uh, this is definitely a trespass of property. Okay, so here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a section in the American jurisprudence that you would put together in your uh, complaint for your son. Um, I'm going to share the screen really quick and you'll see exactly what this is. The American jurisprudence books and right here, trespass, it's, uh, subsection three. It says a trespass, blah, 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 where are we at? What do you want to go? Here we go. Continuing to trespass subsection two, where the act of a wrongdoer involves a course of action, which is a direct invasion of the rights of another. Such conduct is regarded as a trespass of a continuing character for which a remedy by way of injunction will generally lie where the injury caused thereby is otherwise irreparable. Further, where a trespass is a continuing one and not of that class of permanent appropriations to be assessed for all time at once, there may be successive actions for each continuance of the trespass. So the injunction is what you have to put in. A writ of injunction, you're going to put his case number, and you have to go through your constitution and find out all of the sections that they violated. I can think of two. Number one, double jeopardy on a case that's already been resolved. Number two, uh, they showed up, they, they may have had a warrant, but did they provide a warrant that had an attached, approved affidavit of complaint? They never even showed him a warrant. No, they did not show well, him a warrant. Well, there's number two complaint. So anytime the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Rights is not being cared for, that is an irreparable injury. And then I do this under my name, but put his case number in his, obviously it's for him, but I would do that under myself. And uh, I, I need to get my stuff filed on the, on the uh, county level. I was hoping to do that with the case number for myself that was open, but now it's closed. So when I go to uh, make the uh, complaint, um, 
should I just take everything in and just have the complaint and my trust and um, things of all, all the things that I need to do that, the domicile. And this, I, I guess I, there's time limits too. I don't know if I'll have time to have that in the paper for four weeks prior to having to have that paperwork in or, or at least the, you know file the complaint. Some right. papers do not circulate for four weeks. But some of them do one day or less mm -hmm. per oh. week. Okay, mm -hmm. I thought I, yeah. I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, here's one that you can use is is um, Florida Heritage Jewish News. Okay. That's who we use. There's others that you may could find in your state that do it much faster than that. Last time. Uh, but you definitely want to do the injunction. It's it's for him. It wouldn't be under you. Um, there's nothing. There's no real. There's no real need here to involve the trust. Get extremely complicated because he needs fast remedy. Yes, I mean this. It's I, it's it's sort of unnerving actually that they're able to do this or think that they can. I guess they have. They've just. It's unnerving. Well, if you don't know how to enforce your rights, how they think it of it is, well, why can't we do it to you? Yeah. I Sad can. to say. That's that's how they're thinking. If you don't know how to enforce, it doesn't matter if you know your rights, but if you don't know how to enforce, we're gonna do this to you until you kick us in the butt too. So you yeah, have to show up in junction. Exactly. Now, here's here's the kicker. Mm. You do your injunction. Uh -huh. What is the remedy that you're looking for? You're looking for a permanent injunction against his name with the sheriff county. Also, you need this here as well. Okay. I'll show you it. Okay. I still appreciate this. You don't even know. 18 USC 242 is it 241 242 uh is this the one I want or do I want 241 yeah 241 18 USC 241 if two or more persons conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege secured to him by the Constitution. This is your state constitution. All right. Or laws of the United States. That's the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. So either one. Mm -hmm. Or because of his having so exercised the same or if two or more persons go in disguise on the highway or on the premises of another with intent to prevent or hinder his free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege, which is what has happened. Yeah. Men in uniforms on the highway, they shall be fined under this title or in prison not more than 10 years for both. And if death results from the acts committed in the violation of this section, or if such acts include kidnapping, that's what happened. That is exactly it. Aggravated sexual abuse or an attempt to commit aggravated sexual abuse or attempt to kill, they shall be fined under this title or imprisoned for any term of years or for life. You have to go after the county board of supervisors because that's the seats that hold the bonds to the sheriffs and the deputies. And they moved him into the violent offenders where he got jumped and they had him in there for like 24 hours for some reason. And uh, yeah, so they, they did give him, he did end up having bodily harm. As and well. he's not supposed to be in there for 24 hours. As soon as someone is detained, it's immediately you have to be in front of a magistrate immediately i don't care if it's two o'clock in the morning wake them up yeah. that's the law so you have all these things mentioned here 
go back and listen to this once it's uploaded into the site so you All can right. put your production together. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Uh, keep us well informed and keep us up to date on all that process. Absolutely. I certainly will. I certainly will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. I believe I've answered everyone at least once. That's going to be our time today. Any other questions that you guys may have available within the website, ask me a direct question. I'll answer it within the right amount of time of course bear with me a lot of questions come in um like i said i mentioned there's a new site coming out so i'm preparing all that stress testing it to make sure that it can handle the volume of people the people who watch the information without any problems and the new information for the taxes will be there as well so we got some new tiers that's going to come with that there's opportunities like I mentioned in the past where you've done the process already and you can come out of the complete tier and go to a graduate tier for a little bit less than what you're contributing now. So look forward to that. Be patient with me I'm trying to get all this stuff done and um, I'll see you guys on the next first Saturday of the month. Got to get to the private clients on the 15th of this month. Jay, Isaiah, Frenchie, thank you again for helping me out keeping that chat occupied and uh, get those questions asked for them. Flex need tech support. Um, we have a tech support email. Mm, how do I get you that email? Let me see. One second. Tech support, tech support. Where is it at? Uh, Jay or Frenchie can help you with that. I'll help him. Yeah. I'll take care of it. Yeah, I know Jordan has the email address. I just don't know it. Okay. Thank you, Frenchie. Appreciate you. All right, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the weekend and be good. <laughs>